Thanks, Val. I'm excited to be here with you today to share a story of a successful evolving regional workforce partnership, which was catalyzed based on work and relationships developed by the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. First off, I'd like to thank our symposium sponsors, Amitrol and the Manufacturing Skill Standards Council, also known as MSSC. In the world of grant work, funding is hard to come by. Your financial support of the virtual symposium is greatly appreciated. I'd like to provide some context this morning to this particular session. 14 months ago, Phil Jones from the Target Corporation reached out to the center looking for a workforce development solution to their shortage of skilled automation technicians in Southern California. Target needed to fill 11 open positions, upskill some of their existing staff members, and was in the process of building a new next generation highly automated logistics facility with the need for 60 new skilled technicians to keep that facility operational. Phil was hoping to identify regional workforce development resources, which might be able to help Target with this challenge. After some brainstorming together, I introduced Phil to Charles Henkels, one of, one of our presenters today. Charles took the bull by the horns and was able to get the ball rolling, oftentimes uphill, despite a multitude of institutional obstacles and barriers. This presentation will provide background on how a successful program was put together by leveraging regional workforce development resources, a registered apprenticeship program, the Skill Boss Logistics Training and Skill Assessment Device, and the recently released Certified Technician Supply Chain Automation Certificate Program, which is ISO accredited. It's the first of its kind pilot program, which the National Center would like to see replicated in other parts of the country. We're hoping today's talk will help provide a roadmap as a guide to the development of other similar programs nationally. With that said, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, friend, and project champion, Mr. Phil Jones, Director of Supply Chain Engineering, Target Corporation. Phil, take it away. Hey, everybody. My name is Phil Jones, and I am uh, a director inside of uh, Supply Chain Engineering inside of Target's Global Supply Chain and Logistics Operation. Specifically, uh, I have worked with Target for 24 years and have worked with the National Center for close to nine years. Uh, I'm currently an industry co-chair and a member of the National Visiting Committee. And today what I'd like to go ahead and tee up for this uh, next hour time period has been the evolution of how we have partnered with a variety of different groups to go ahead and look at uh, developing supply chain technicians, not only for Target where we have a significant need, but also inside of the broader United States as a whole. And then to go ahead and highlight very specifically the uh, partnership that we've done with our training center inside of Southern California to go ahead and then share with everybody a variation of a possibility that you could consider uh, as you are looking at uh, ways to go ahead and tackle your talent challenges. Let me go ahead and talk a little bit about my talent challenge here for uh, to give context to our, my problem here. For the past decade, Target has really struggled to go ahead and maintain desirable staffing of maintenance technicians inside of all of our buildings. We currently have about 650 technicians in over uh, 40 facilities across the country. In the last five years, this has become particularly acute and a pain point for us as it's very challenging for us to both expand and to be able to go ahead and take care of uh, the demand for uh, operational support that we must provide. This has caused us to expend a tremendous amount of recruiting effort and a lot of partnership with our human resources department to try to gain appropriate staffing. Now, from working with the National Center for Supply Chain Automation, I've discovered that uh, misery loves good companies. I'm not the only one out there specifically struggling with this. As I talk with many industry peers, this is commonplace across the board and represents a tremendous challenge across the country for us uh, with regard to the ability to go ahead and support supply chain needs. 
This has been compounded specifically here lately with the evolution of uh, advanced automation, including robotics, because not only do we now need to hire a larger number of technicians, but the overall skill sets associated with advanced automation have really moved uh, the skill bar higher, which means we now have to look at how to upskill our existing base of technicians, as well as to hire new technicians. So to give you context, what you see here is a map that shows uh, the target supply chain of over 40 facilities overlaid inside of the United States. The blue uh, boxes represent logistics centroids where there are larger concentrations of uh, supply chain uh, operations specifically. And you see, not, not surprisingly, a lot of our facilities are located inside of those. Of note, in the next several years, targeted ends to open over uh, 30 additional facilities across the country, especially in urban areas to go ahead and support our ongoing growth. So this increases our overall need and, and also increases the uh, challenge that we have overall. So first off, let me talk about the evolution of where we've got with regard to technician development. Very quickly, I realized that it was not going to go ahead and work to follow a status quo where I was principally focused on conventional recruiting or attempting to go ahead and engage in a talent war with a competitor in many markets where I just took care of myself. It became really obvious that we needed to focus specifically on what I call growing the size of the whole pie, or in this case, increasing the number of supply chain technicians everywhere in order for us to be able to meet our demands. So the focus then grew to who can we collaborate with and what role do we take to go ahead and make that happen. Based on this target focus specifically on taking a leadership role specifically in how to go ahead and collaborate and create sustainable technician or technical talent pipelines inside of our communities. Uh, that meant that significant participation with many partners. It meant partnership with uh, companies that in the past we had looked at in an adversarial basis and began now to look at as partners in a, a common challenge. And this meant a tactic of long-term collaboration engagement with key parties that could help us out at both a corporate and local level. So that included industry partners, schools uh, inside of our communities and the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. So let me talk a little bit about this evolution. What you see in blue represents our initial stab at things. And this was focused on how to go ahead and meet many of the uh, community college leaders, specifically in our areas, uh, using connections with the National Center for Supply Chain Automation so that we could establish relationships. And along with that, then encouraging uh, industry collaboration in conjunction with educators to go ahead and demonstrate the need for broader supply chain inside of major urban markets. Traditionally, Target did not have a large enough demand that we could make a total difference, specifically with a community college. But when you partnered us up with many other companies with supply chain facilities, you began to demonstrate a real need that was very desirable for community colleges to figure out how they could possibly fill. Now, a, a collaboration that occurred between the National Center for Supply Chain Automation Amatrol as a training group and the Manufacturing Skill Standards Council to look at how to develop stackable certifications and training to go ahead and facilitate the development of supply chain technicians offered a tremendous opportunity that we recognized could potentially be a game changer for us. We looked at this as a key opportunity specifically for us to go ahead and demonstrate that leadership role by going ahead and volunteering resources to support the efforts to go ahead and further develop and accelerate that effort. Therefore, <clears throat> we focused significantly uh, then on bringing along our, uh, our global supply chain leadership 
uh, on the strategy that we had, taking advantage of the uh, certified technician supply chain automation and the associated skill boss logistics device to go ahead and demonstrate how we could go ahead and begin to self-develop and then do partnerships with different uh, groups in order to go ahead and develop significant numbers of technicians inside of our communities. Along with that, we then created a maintenance technician trainee role, which is a full-time role inside of our teams that is focused on learning and developing the basic skills using the skill boss and the certified technician supply chain automation framework in order to go ahead and fully develop themselves into our maintenance technician roles. We have created a training center in Southern California where we have a convergence of five different supply chain facilities in close proximity to each other to go ahead and create a purpose-built training facility where we could go ahead and put our device and then be able to run classes or cohorts of students in order to go ahead and learn the necessary skills. This began our journey into in-house training development, specifically as an option. In the past, when I have spoken to uh, groups with the National Center for Supply Chain Automation, we always said we could not develop in-house talent, but this now gives us the opportunity to actually develop uh, training and people inside of our organization, unlocking a new and significant uh, group of people that we could go ahead and give opportunities to significantly increase their overall uh, well-being by going ahead and allowing them to upskill themselves and become technicians, and for us to fill a demand that we had. We purchased uh, four skill boss logistics and set up one of those, as I said, as a training center. As we began running our first students through, we realized that we'd hit what I call a gold mine with regard to what we're doing here. And we realized that there is a demand for this elsewhere. And we began to purchase skill boss logistics in several other markets. We are going to open a second training center inside of the Midwest and go ahead and focus on being able to do robotics training. And we have focused on doing some things like remote learning and then upskilling training specifically in order to go ahead and uh, meet our needs specifically. And this then opens an, up, an opportunity for us to then look at how can we do different types of partnerships with community colleges in order to go ahead and take advantage of apprenticeship programs, to go ahead and share resources, to go ahead and make this available. So we're very much interested in doing partnerships in many communities in order to go ahead and develop our options. So specifically what I'd like to highlight today and then have others go ahead and talk about following up is to go ahead and talk about the partnership in our training center inside of Southern California, specifically key partnerships that have helped to make that happen. So I will have Charles Henkels will be talking here specifically about launch apprenticeship and how we partnered to go ahead and take advantage of some of the opportunities with launch apprenticeship. Paul Perkins from Amatrol will talk about the evolution of the certified technician supply chain automation and the skill boss logistics device and how this fits in that framework. And then Josh Gonzalez, who runs our training center, will go ahead and show some videos and talk about how we have evolved what we do here. So at this point, it is my pleasure to go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Charles Henkel specifically and to go ahead and have him talk about launch apprenticeship. Thanks so much, uh, Phil. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really nice to be here um, and see such a, such a great turnout too. Uh, so my name is Charles Henkels and uh, I'm the project director for the Launch Apprenticeship Network. Uh, it's, I'm based out of Riverside Community College District. And what, what Launch is, is it's a, um, it's a collaboration between the community colleges in Riverside and San Bernardino County in, in Southern California. Um, you know, and basically what we do is we set up partnerships like the one we're talking, talking about today. So where launch came from was, was basically, basically it was around a conversation that was taking place. So uh, 
very consistently, we would we'd have uh, interactions with industry partners um, that were, you know, in industrial technologies, and they were expressing the same issue. They were saying, hey, we, we're having trouble finding the talent that we need. Uh, you just heard Phil kind of talk a little bit about it a moment ago, but they basically saying they couldn't find people that they need. And then even when people were, were coming to them, uh, there wasn't always a feeling that they were ready for the industry that they were they were entering. Um, but what was kind of a, a dissonance was at the same time we were having this kind of conversation, we, we were seeing our students do things like this. This is a picture of a group of high school students that were winning national skills competitions in, in automated manufacturing. And so, you know, what we were sensing was it wasn't so much an issue of whether or not we were delivering the right curriculum, but, but it just seemed like there was this gap and this disconnect between our, our regional uh, you know, businesses and employers and industry partners and our students. It seemed like we needed to, to bridge that. And so we, you know, basically what we proposed was this idea of using registered as apprenticeship as a way to address that skills gap in our region. And so you know, you know, the idea being that instead of putting students through a conventional pathway where we offer them you know, curriculum for, for a set period of time, like through a certificate or through a degree, and then we, then we send them out into the world. Instead of doing that, what we really did was we said, hey, let's, let's actually see if we can begin embedding students into the workforce as part of their education. Um, and this required obviously a really deep uh, partnership with industry. We kind of had to change the, the way that we discussed you know, program development um, and, and workforce education. The new role that we were asking employers to play was to not necessarily be consumers of the talent, that was coming out of the schools, but rather to be creators of the talent with us. Um, I'd have to acknowledge that, you know, in California, we are, we have a, a well-supported apprenticeship initiative. Our governor's goal has been to reach 500,000 apprentices in the state by 2029. That's about, that's about five times the size it is right now. Um, and so a lot of funding that we pursued was, was through state funding through um, uh, the Chancellor, the, the California Chances Office, a uh, strong workforce program and, and California apprenticeship in, initiative. And we use it to help get programs like these underway. The strategy behind all of that funding though is this regional approach. Basically the big idea is that we would create these kind of clusters of, of businesses and, and schools that could kind of serve uh, general sectors and, and, de and develop programs like these. So, what that looks like, you know, from a kind of a strategic implementation standpoint is what we do is we, we developed a regional apprenticeship intermediary structure where companies participate through uh, uh, apprenticeship committees. And, and so just as, you know, Phil mentioned before, the idea is we don't really build programs necessarily just to serve one business only, but we actually ask those businesses that are in, you know, kind of like areas to, to collaborate. Uh, think of this as, as a joint effort of, of growing the pie. So we focus on multi-employer structures so that we can aggregate the needs um, in particular professional pathways. We also try to uh, leverage multiple organizations and workforce systems. And so we, we also don't really think of this as a, you know, one institution, one school, you know, type of, uh, type of strategy. We have many colleges that participate. We have uh, multiple high school districts, with two workforce development boards. And the goal is to really streamline those resources in a way where we can serve the users better. Um, we, right now we do a, a blended approach where, where some of our, our um, education is delivered through our, you know, our existing kind of CTE infrastructure in the colleges. And then we also do some contract ed, not for credit services as a way to pilot curriculum and, and test it out. The big idea, you know, going back to again, is, is really what we're, what we're trying to build with launch is, is an apprenticeship system that people can plug into. We don't want it to be complicated. We don't want to you know, change what we're doing based on, on what grant we have currently or, or, or what the opportunity is. We're really trying to build a system that you know, we, we, want, we want this to be around for 50 years is, is the big idea. So I get a lot of questions about what is a, you know, a regional intermediary. So I'll just address that real quick. So in apprenticeship, you know, basically to do a registered apprenticeship program, you need a, a program sponsor. And this oftentimes is very challenging for individual businesses to play that role or even individual schools. And so what we did was we established a, a regional uh, intermediary program sponsor that was registered with the, the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. But the big idea being that the employers, 
they just had to plug in as opposed to creating whole new programs on their own. They could plug into this regional system and kind of, you know, like I said, kind of benefit from, from being a part of the whole. Same thing with the institutions. They could also plug in to, to the sectors that they were focused on creating apprenticeships with. Um, in most cases, the schools, you know, provide the administrative services, registering the apprentices, operating the, you know, program, working with the, with the Department of Labor, with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. The industry partners, the big ask we really make of them is, is to provide that, that kind of upskilling opportunity, that work-based learning opportunity. And then as much as possible, like I said, we leverage the existing CTE, you know, infrastructure that's in place among the colleges. So in this particular case, you know, I, I want to kind of outline what that means in, in an applied view. So you can see to do a program like this, you know, involved, it involved multiple partners. So, so Target, they're going to outline a little bit more what they're doing, but, you know, you know in essence, they're providing a paid work-based learning experience for their employees, which, which is something amazing. I think it's, that's, uh, you know, something we should really be, you know, um, encouraging, supporting wherever we can. So at launch, as I mentioned before, we provide that intermediary structure. Um, then one of the things that we did that was kind of unique, uh, and this was sort of based off, off of, of really, a, I would say, the industry's indication that they were really going to get behind this, this MSSC uh, Amatrol Skills Boss approach to training technicians. And we, we kind of trusted their, their leadership in that. And so we also purchased some equipment that we could we could have the same training at the colleges that's taking place over at the at the target facilities as well. And then we have a partnering institution, Norco College, that's actually working right now on, on how they can how they can accredit this program. Where we're going, where we're looking ahead. So we're excited about this program obviously as a pilot, um, but we also look at it as how do we move this forward? How do we expand it? And so some of the things that we're doing right now are looking at the creation of pre-apprenticeship pathways. These are for individuals that don't already work for Target that are in our, you know, in our region, high school students, job seekers. We, you know, our goal is we want to begin providing a pre-apprenticeship program, you know, based around those MSSC certificates that will help someone enter that industry and enter programs like, like Targets. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're having our uh, college faculty you know, really take a very close look at, at the curriculum that's delivered through this program uh, to look at, to, to work with the instructors and provide, you know, a really strong feed la feedback loop between system engineers working in the industry and college faculty that are, that are training technicians in this area. And then lastly, big picture things that we're really excited about is we're looking at, this is a, also a possibility for a pilot in uh, competency-based education through direct assessment. We see this as kind of, kind of just something that that is gonna allow us to really be student-centered uh, while industry-led. So what I wanna do now is I wanna, I wanna hand it off uh, to the president of Amatrol who will talk a little bit more about Skills Boss uh, and that's Paul Perkins. So Paul, I'm gonna turn off my camera and you can take it away. Great, thank you, Charles. Supporting Target's efforts, a complete training and certification program was developed called Certified Technician Supply Chain Automation, or CTSCA, as you guys know. The development has been an extensive process spanning over five years, and I can truly say it's been a team effort. Leadership has come from five key organizations. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, including the National Center, which created the vision and engaged industry experts with the help of industry associations, MHI and Mahita, MSSC, which created the certifications and Amatrol, which created the learning materials. And the process to engage industry experts ultimately assembled a group consisting of the who's who in the supply chain industry with iconic names like some of those that you see here. These companies provided expert advisors to define the various parts of the program and spent countless hours reviewing and testing to validate the outcomes. The result from the effort is a total system consisting of occupational standards, certification assessments, online course materials, and a hands-on training device. This slide shows the structure of the MSSC certifications. And as you can see, CTSCA is comprised of three individual certifications. The first is equipment maintenance, which certifies skills and systems operation, safety, preventive maintenance, lubrication, and machine adjustments. The next one is equipment repair, 
which certifies skills in installation and troubleshooting of electromechanical devices such as fluid power, AC and DC electric motors, and mechanical power transmission. And finally, network repair, which certifies skills in installation and troubleshooting of controllers, networks, and the entire system. These three certifications have been aligned with common technician classifications companies use today. So individuals can go to work with just one of the certifications, the, the first one, the EM, and then they can gain additional certifications to rise up the career ladder. Each certification consists of an online test of 90 to 120 minutes and a hands-on evaluation. To prepare individuals, Amatrols develop courses which are aligned with each, of, with each of the three certifications. Once students have learned the concepts uh, of the, uh, uh, through the online courses and simulators, they are ready to practice uh, uh, their skills with the hands-on uh, materials. But the e-learning materials that come with the program are designed to actually prepare students through hands-on work uh, with uh, virtual simulators. And you can see an example of one of the simulators in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, which is a, a pneumatic simulator. So the, the courses are interactive, multimedia-based. They have uh, graphics, 3D uh, uh, interactions, uh, and uh, in each course is about 200 hours, which covers the time to cover the e-learning and the hands-on. Once the students complete that work, they then go to the hands-on part of the program, and that's working with Skill Boss Logistics. And so uh, the device that you see here in the lower left-hand corner of the screen is actually a working tabletop size sortation system. And even though it's compact, Skill Boss uses the same technologies and techniques used in large-scale sortation systems, like the system you see on the right side of the slide. On SkillBoss, packages are inducted, scanned, routed to multiple conveyors, and then sorted into three destination chutes, or if there's a bad scan, sent to a rework station. And the skills st uh, that students learn on SkillBoss are not only applicable to sortation systems, we also made an extra effort to include a wide range of technologies so the skills learned and assessed apply to other types of supply chain automation. In addition to being used as a training device, SkillBoss is also used for assessing the hands-on skills in the CTSCA certification. So everyone who gets certified in, the, uh, in CTSCA has to test out on this device to ensure the evaluation is consistent. There are approximately 100 skills that can be performed on SkillBoss and the skills are aligned across the three certifications of CTSCA. And to perform the skills, the learners work with three major elements. One is a human machine interface or HMI, which runs a warehouse control software, which you can see in the lower left corner of the screen, a control unit with PLC, ethernet network, and a variable frequency drive, and the workstation itself, which includes multiple types of conveyor sensors, actuators, and a barcode scanner. All these elements work together to create a real sortation system as you would find in a distribution center. In addition to these elements, which enable SkillBoss to operate, SkillBoss also includes another element which is designed to make it not operate. And this is actually the most important feature of the system because it enables individuals to learn and assess their troubleshooting skills. And to accomplish this objective, we use a computer-based fault insertion system called Fault Pro. Fault Pro consists of an electronic circuit board and software that inserts faults into the system and then it tracks the student troubleshooting activity. There's over 50 real world faults that can be put into the system so that students get a chance to actually have realistic troubleshooting training, which is actually the most important skill a technician must have. So now that I've uh, described the overall operation of the system, let's watch a short video so you can see Skill Boss in action. The SkillBoss workstation is designed to be accessed from all four sides, so multiple students can work on it at the same time. We've also designed it for safety with features like guards with safety switches placed over critical moving components. To start the process, the packages are placed on the induction roller conveyor. These packages are then fed with gap spacing to the induction belt conveyor to be scanned by a barcode reader. The first package receives a good scan, so the vertical sorter remains horizontal and passes it to the distribution conveyor on the backside. This next package, though, got a bad scan, so the vertical sorter routes it to the recirculation conveyor on the top level. 
the package stops at a rework station where a person can fix the problem, which in this case is to flip the package over so to show the barcode, and then it's released to get scanned again. The final stage of the process is to sort the packages into their destinations, and this occurs on the distribution conveyor using three electropneumatic diverters, which sort the packages into three discharge chutes. Each diverter uses a different method common to sortation systems. To monitor and control the process, learners use a warehouse control software that runs on a touchscreen PC. The software features graphical screens to operate the system and has many other functions which are accessed from a main menu. Examples are system management where the system is configured and there are many order handling functions such as order picking, order tracking, order entry, and order analysis. And then there are also alarm screens and even a 3D monitoring and operation screen. And finally, students learn troubleshooting using Amatrol's Fault Pro software, which is accessed from the HMI PC. In summary, SkillBoss is designed to provide a very realistic experience for learning a wide variety of skills in operation, maintenance, and troubleshooting of supply chain automation. As you might expect, teachers have much to learn to teach and certify individuals in the CTSCA certifications and skill boss. To make sure it's a success, we've also developed a master teacher training course. In the course, teachers will learn how to implement the certification, use the online training courses, and become thoroughly familiar with skill boss logistics. The training is being held in Amatrol in Indiana with a standard course schedule. We have two dates coming up in May and August and more dates being added as new programs come on board. And we can also do training on site as well. So that's what I have to share about CTSCA and Skill Boss. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or MSSC's Neil Reddy at these email addresses. And now I'll turn it over to Josh to talk about the implementation. Josh. Thanks, Paul, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joshua Gonzalez. I'm actually the Senior Operations Manager um, overseeing our startup in uh, Southern California. And uh, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys some exciting information we've been going through um, in the last six months of uh, the program. So really starting with um, all the partnerships that we've talked about, um, we started this journey back in November of 2020. Uh, to train our current um, population of technicians, but also to look to grow our future uh, MTTs, which we call maintenance technician trainees. By in integrating Amatrol Skill Boss Logistics and MSSC's uh, Supply Chain Automation Program, we've really been able to execute a training program that includes both interactive online-based modules, also led by Target Certified Instructor, and we've had a phased approach in applying the practical application to the Skill Boss Logistics and then later on into the field. So what's really been the goal? The goal is to educate and develop and certify our technicians with a standard program across the network, but really looking to drive efficiency and speed of learning. Um, we've been able to um, turn our MTTs into MTs within seven months is what we're expecting. You'll get to see how practical learning has been the key in driving speed of skills retention in the, in the skill boss logistics and also how their e-learning is applicable within the modules to apply a lot of the learnings within that as well. Um, you'll hear from what we call coaches is our trainers from the field. And lastly, you'll get a sneak peek at how Target is utilizing the Southern California facility to extend outside of its four walls um, as in a hybrid program, getting virtual classes um, from different distribution centers in the network. So as you can imagine, preparing a program of this scale comes with many administrative tasks. So I'll walk you through a few of them. One of them was location selection. And you heard Phil talking about having five distribution centers within 15 miles. Um, we found that our Fontana location, regional distribution center in California, would be able to accommodate the 1,100 square feet we needed of space for 10 students and the skill boss logistics to be housed out of. Also having a dedicated instructor was a learning for us for this course. Um, we have to have a coordinator and be able to support the technical portion of the training um, with an instructor. And we'll hear more from Javier Avila, who was previously an engineer at one of our distribution centers at Target. The recruiting and hiring and onboarding in partnership with HR, this is a six to eight week process, creating the job posting, understanding what needs to be in the job posting, screening the candidates, determining what the candidates need, looking at their resumes, 
developing the expectations for qualifications. This was the big one. In a partnership um, with many HR leaders and, um, and, and technical experts, we were able to develop an internal skills assessment that gauges the level of problem solving and deductive reasoning from the candidates. They're not expected to come into the program knowing how to do things, but we do want them to be successful um, in the program. Coordinating with distribution site leaders and schedules for MTTs. We're now at 13 MTTs and we've had to apply different schedules to ensure that we're not overwhelming the site coaches with too many uh, to train. And then also looking to assign a dedicated coach. This was a big learning for us as we initially got started. A coach is somebody that needs to be able to follow the curriculum, not jump ahead or go rogue in the training um, and be able to teach them in a safe manner the practical application of what they're currently learning in, in the program. And lastly, you'll get to hear actual experiences and meet the MTTs um, from the field. This is a quick snapshot of our regional distribution center in, um, in Fontana. And again, this was the location that was selected for um, our training center. And um, it's gonna be able to support future market expansion opportunities. It gave us again that 1100 square foot space that we needed. And it serves as a continuous learning location for existing maintenance technicians and leaders. Here's kind of the two adjacent rooms um, while they were in construction um, that ultimately became our, our training center. Overall, this process took from design to finish about three months. And in the beginning of April, we were able to reap the benefits. You can see how beautiful the training center has, has come out to. So this is able to house um, 10 students max. You see that they have um, their laptops, they have, uh, the um, screens for them to be able to look at diagrams and schematics on the monitors. And then one of the features we've recently added is uh, PTZ, PTZ cameras throughout the entire training center. And this has allowed MTTs across our target network to attend virtual class time in Southern California, which is fantastic because it allows for that real-time interaction with our instructor. So far for the first two cohorts, uh, we've been able to fill um, those 13 MTT positions internally um, that attend simultaneous classes over um, a four week class schedule a week. Um, these uh, MTTs are also um, serving our uh, local um, distribution centers. So not all of them are just housed from one distribution center. We're also looking at applying future cohorts of trainings to upskill our current maintenance technician to population and provide that network um, curriculum to uh, be able to upskill them to a maintenance technician three. And you'll hear more about that in a bit. So this is Javier Avila. Um, in just a bit, I'll pass it over to him, uh, but he is uh, an engineer with Target. He has six years of experience. He did go through the certification process with MSSC and Amatrol, and he is supporting our current cohorts with the plans of supporting up to six to seven cohorts up to 2023. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Javier so you can learn a little bit about how he uses the curriculum and how some of uh, the MSSC um, LMS is applied from an instructor's perspective. Hi, uh, I'm Javier Avila. I'm the instructor for the MPT program here in uh, Montana, California at T5-3. And uh, I went into this program because I love teaching. And so I saw the opportunity that they wanted to open this uh, in Southern California because of the uh, number of distribution centers we have. So we have a, a unique opportunity to uh, train the pool of uh, future maintenance technicians for this program. And so we're using the uh, tools created by Amatrol and that are um, part of the training program um, from uh, MSSC, which is a manufacturing skills um, center. And uh, I have here one of the tools that uh, the main technicians in training have um, I just have a snapshot of uh, the actual simulator, which uses, this is for an uh, electrical, and this is a specifically a motor control circuit. And so they get to know every component 
uh, how it works, and then how to tr troubleshoot the whole circuit. You can see here they have av available a meter you can set up to voltage, current, resistance, so forth, and they can take measurements on the circuit. And so they actually have the individual components, they wire them together, uh, following the schematic provided, and then they troubleshoot it. Uh, first verify that the whole, the whole circuit works, and then they go into settings, and then they are able to induce faults that are generated randomly. So they don't, don't know exactly what component is going to fail. And so that's what they have to figure out using the tools provided. And you can see, for example, how fast the MTTs get to be a troubleshooting. Uh, for example, this specific uh, MTT was able to troubleshoot seven faults in a row in about uh, less than 13 minutes. So that's less than, less than two minutes per fault. So they get very proficient at uh, taking readings on the circuit to figure out where the problem is and then isolate it to the component. And then verify the component off circuit and be able to replace the right component. And so they do this before they actually get to uh, the real equipment where they actually are going to be working with live voltage. And we have the equipment over here. And again, this is uh, the skill boss logistics from Amatrol, which has um, all the all the basic components of a of a solder or any automation equipment. And this is really a mini solder. Uh, it has a PLC, Ethernet switch, a VFD, and uh, the motors to actually move the conveyors in uh, this sortation system. So what's really great about this program, as you can see, it's, it's very interactive, but it also allows the instructor to see progress made by the um, MTTs. And in this case, how quickly they're able to diagnose these faults. Um, and then quickly be able to take these module learnings and apply them on the skill boss logistics in a, in a safe electrical environment. So I really enjoy this uh, picture. This was taken uh, back in November of 2020. Um, our first cohort, um, you can see uh, it's, it wasn't in our um, beautiful training center yet. Um, it was in one of our video conference rooms in Target. And at this point, whatever you see is what we had as part of the program. Any type of additional materials, um, peripheral skills, um, laptops all had to be, um, we had to learn that we needed that along the way. Um, we, uh, we did end up uh, taking a, um, a pause for the month of December due to COVID and resumed classes back in, um, in January. Um, so our target MTT apprentices go through an initial screening of their resumes and brand screening interviews, and then a technical assessment that focuses on their ability to problem solve. Um, again, there needs to be more of a passion to learn in this industry, and that's really the candidates we've selected. A lot of them have previous junior college experience or have automation or an electrical and in, um, industrial uh, degree, um, which is fantastic. It serves as a great baseline, a great foundation for this program. The MTTs will go through a 34 week period. Paul touched on it, a little bit over 130 modules from the MSSE curriculum. We expect our MTTs to do about four to five modules per week. And again, they're in classroom time two days a week and then two day, the additional two days a week, they're on their home site with their coaches. Fast forward, um, this is actually pictures taken um, first week of April as we onboarded our uh, second cohort. You can see they got off to the right start um, from some of the learnings we had in November. Um, but we expect to certify MTTs on equipment repair and equipment maintenance, which is our first two certifications in order for our technicians to progress into an actual MT role and be qualified to go into a target-based uh, technician role. Um, this will take, again, about seven months to complete, um, which was a great learning for us, and it's, it's fantastic to be able to get technicians into the field that quickly. With expected target growth, we're projected to have about 53 MTT certified and into the field by the middle of 2023 as well as 50 technicians certified in our more advanced network repair curriculum um, by that same time as well. 
And I'll play this video and kind of talk over it. And I just really enjoy it because it's a really good interaction in the sense of, Paul touched on it, having multiple MTTs being able to actually see what they're going to be working on. But you can see here, Javier is providing that coaching experience throughout this. And that's really been kind of the middle step as we look at modular based curriculum. The next step is applying it on the skill boss logistics. And this really gears up our MTTs to take their learnings into the field on our material handling equipment. This next slide um, will we'll showcase a little bit about Javier Harris. He is one of our uh, experienced maintenance technician twos from Fontana, California. He's trained several uh, new hires, external and also supporting as a coach for this MTT apprenticeship program. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Javier to um, provide a little bit of context about himself and uh, what he thinks about the program. Hi, my name is Javier Harris. Uh, I've been with Target going on 12 years. I've been a mechanic for six years, transitioned from mechanic one to mechanic two. That's my current position. What I did before, I was an inbound. Uh, five years throwing boxes like everybody else. Um, what I do as a support as a coach is um, they come from the classroom with some type of idea, and then I facilitate that idea and show them the works, show them real time demonstration. Uh, the benefits of the program that I see from seeing external candidates to the new program candidates is that they come out of this program with you know, a lot of ideas and they come in running. So it's really easy for me to show them what they're working on based on the program. I think what's really great um, about what Javier highlights is uh, the curriculum provides him really strong context to be able to follow and train versus trying to decide for the MTT what, they're, what he's gonna show them next. He can have a very structured approach in what he's gonna show them in the field. Um, for our first cohort of MTTs, they're actually midway through their program, and um, we currently have four in our first cohort. All of them have completed their first certification with a passing grade of 90% or better. Um, what we did directly after um, the certification test, which was the equipment maintenance, we gave all um, four of our M MTTs a maintenance technician one assessment which is what we would normally give our MT assessments if they're external candidates. Um, we actually found that three out of our four um, MTTs would actually be job offered an MT1 position at this current juncture, um, and they're four months into the program, which again is, is just a fact, fantastic data point um, as we continue to, uh, to learn. So Jade is one of our trailblazers. He is one of those four MTTs that joined um, from our first cohort. Uh, Jade previously attended a local junior college for two years where he received his industrial electrical degree. He has a passion for continued learning in this field. So when this program came up, Jade definitely wanted to put his name in the hat and he was, he was selected. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jade. He's gonna walk us through what a day in the life of uh, MTT looks like as they spend classroom time going through modular-based um, learnings. Uh, hello, my name is Jade Gray. I'm currently a maintenance technician training here with Target. Um, I've been with Target for a couple of years now. Um, previously, I had some experience at a junior college nearby with um, industrial electrical technology. Um, when this program opened up, I thought it was a good opportunity because I wanted to become a technician here with Target. Um, a lot of this program has a lot to do with um, Based training. Um, it really helps us to learn how the components work on a surface level, um, see how they work together, allowing us to troubleshoot it here um, on the computer safely before we go out onto the floor and do the more hands on. Um, so, right here, I can show you an example um, of the circuit. Here is the sequence control circuit, and we're trying to troubleshoot it. It'll automatically put in a fault, and we have to try to figure out what the fault is. So, we can look at it. Um, we can hit this start push button. We can notice that the motor doesn't run, but this light comes on that's connected to this um, control relay. So we could use this little um, multimeter that's here on the simulator to check for voltage and whatever else we need. Um, so we know that the because the light's on that there's voltage present, but for whatever reason the motor is not running. So we can check voltage across the motor 
and we can see that it is not getting any voltage right now. So for the motor, we have the motor starter. So we can look to just make sure, follow it over here to see if the motor starter is getting voltage. And we can see that the motor starter is supply, uh, does have 208 coming into it. So we have to find out why this motor starter isn't sending that voltage out to the motor. So with that, we can check across all three of these contacts and we can see, and we can manually activate it here to make sure that it's working properly, which that one is. And we can just go across and check all three of them. And we see on this one, it stays at 120 volt even after it's being activated. So we know that right here on L2 is where our problem is. There's an open there. So it's just something like that. That's a good practical example of troubleshooting, narrowing down to what component it is, seeing exactly what's wrong with that component. So that later in the field, have the same thing. We'll know that this is the part that's wrong and the thing that we need to replace. So Jade was quoted as saying he has been able to learn more and retain more information in the last four months than at any point uh, in his previous schooling. Um, this was not stated in a negative manner towards any edu educational system because without the fundamentals in his industrial electrical degree, um, Jade would not be as advanced as he currently is right now. Um, however, it does shed some light on the strong, strong interactive curriculum and how the practical application of this program is really being impactful. What are the advantages of this curriculum? So when Jade completes the classroom training, he will be able to have a master's certification once completing all three certifications. Getting the first two certifications will allow Jade to apply for an MT1 or an MT2 position within Target while still having the ability to complete the last certification. And then lastly, Jade is participating in a paid apprenticeship program. Um, so he's becoming familiar with Target equipment. So kind of in closing, um, what were some of the critical learnings from our perspective at Target? So the MTT recruiting and onboarding is, is definitely key. Having um, that structure, but also understanding that it does take time to recruit and onboard uh, six to eight weeks on average. Um, dedicated site coaches. I cannot uh, emphasize this piece as, as much as Javier Harris showed us. Having the right coach with the right attitude and willing to stick to their curriculum um, is, is key um, to the practical learning for the MTTs. The network strategy for MTTs, um, this is big. So our virtual classes, again, just started about three weeks ago, but we're already seeing some great gains from that. So continuing with making sure that we're able to extend this learning outside of our four walls in Southern California. And then lastly, um, ensuring everything we do is founded on the practical training foundation. Um, this is key uh, to this training program, and, and truly, if you speak to any of the MTTs, they'll tell you that's how they were able to best learn is once they started applying this in the field. Some of the program wins is setting up the training center with cameras, as I spoke about. Um, this has been a, a very um, uh, exciting new learning. We're, we're excited to continue to expand in this area and, and learn from it as well. The integration of continuous um, technicians to further their technical development. So we talked a lot about how maintenance technician trainees are being introduced into the field through this program, but also leveraging this program to upskill our current technician population and really get them into more of those control base and de data network through that network repair curriculum um, is something we're excited about. And then lastly, uh, the timing of it. New maintenance technicians ready for the field within seven months. So really having that foundational learning um, to be able to take into the field. So I thank you all for your time. Um, hopefully this was, was excellent. This is exciting to share. And, and with that, I will pass it back to Steve Harrington. Thanks so much, Josh. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for providing an excellent overview of this innovative program. Please remember all of this was done over the past year with COVID-19 restrictions in place, which presented numerous delays and challenges. At the onset, the intent was to have a dedicated instructor from an Oracle College handle the classroom elements of this project. This just wasn't possible with COVID-19 and related restrictions. Fortunately, things are now moving forward in this direction to have uh, educators from uh, the school involved with the program. In true partnership form, each party has contributed substantial financial and human capital into the development of this program. This is an essential element to any real partnership. Now this pilot program has been successfully incubated with Target. The business case exists 
in support of the long-term vision, which is to, to develop regional training sites centered on this program with broader community involvement and a multitude of companies participating, basically taking this incubated um, project and rolling it out where a lot of companies are involved and a lot of resource partners are involved and, uh, and cohort recruitment is done um, from resource partners. Great starting wages, a growing occupational demand, uh, demand with a deferred, with a defined career pathway. It sounds like we're headed in the right direction. Now let's move forward with the Q and A. Um, so I'd received one question at the front end, which is uh, uh, this question is uh, probably dedicated, uh, directed best to uh, Phil Jones. What is the general job description and required skill set for these techs, and what is uh, the, the pay range for these positions, either at Target or industry wide? If you could speak to that, Phil. Yeah, so in, in, in Target specifically, we end up having multiple levels of maintenance technician. Uh, so what happens is uh, there is a maintenance technician trainee, which is a, a full-time student that we have hired at Target. And uh, their focus is on training specifically to go ahead and gain the skills to become a maintenance technician. And then there are three levels fundamentally of maintenance uh, skills. A maintenance technician, one is a starting maintenance technician is principally focused on uh, doing preventive maintenance. Uh, the, there is less troubleshooting focus at that point. Specifically, it's very much focused on mechanical and basic electrical skills uh, oriented necessary to go ahead and do uh, regularly scheduled maintenance on different pieces of equipment. Our maintenance technician level two does preventative maintenance, but uh, with more skills, they handle troubleshooting and repairs of equipment that have broken down and are expected to be able to go ahead and maintain the full spectrum of all of our different pieces of equipment. That involves a more advanced electrical and electronics uh, background, as well as advanced mechanical skill sets. A maintenance technician three inside of our framework is uh, does advanced control systems troubleshooting and also is a trainer for maintenance technician trainees. So those are the skill sets they focus on. They need to be able to know basic PLC troubleshooting and be able to program advanced uh, devices uh, like uh, servo drives, uh, variable frequency drives, uh, troubleshoot networks and so forth. If you were to talk a general range, I can't tell you exact specifics, but I can tell you the industry as a whole, it is not untypical for maintenance technicians to go ahead and range everywhere from the low $20 per hour into the mid range $30 per hour. And some of your advanced technicians can be paid mid 30s to lower 40s uh, per hour. This varies tremendously from a uh, region to region area based on what the job market looks like. So that, that doesn't tell you target specific, but tells you what the industry generally is. Well, thank you, Phil. So it basically sounds like the wage range is somewhere at the front end around $50,000 a year, upwards toward, toward more skilled techs making uh, uh, upwards of 80 or $90,000 a year. That's so correct. Thanks for, thanks for providing that guidance without revealing target specific uh, proprietary data. Um, we had a handful of questions come in around the uh, high school arena. And I'm gonna go ahead and feed this to um, Paul, but, but Paul, the Skill Boss Logistics device is an amazing invention. So first of all, congratulations on that invention. It's the next kind of the next generation of trainer that can do uh, 100, uh, 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 teach and assess 100 different skills. Um, is this skill assessment device appropriate for use in high schools? Or is the material and subject matter uh, too advanced for students? Well, thank you, Steve, for the compliment on Skill Boss. And it, you know, as I'd said earlier, it really has been a team effort, and we've had so many great minds uh, from the many industry partners. And uh, uh, Target certainly uh, one of the most significant, and and certainly all the the folks that you guys have engaged, and and I think that's uh, really resulted in a in a superior. 
uh, training device. And, and, and so in answer to your question about high school uh, students, uh, absolutely, Skill Boss is a fit for it. We actually already have several high schools that are using it now. And, and thankfully, the certification system that MSSC created is a stair-stepped uh, system. So uh, the first certification equipment maintenance is absolutely doable by a high school student, probably a junior or senior. And I think from the standpoint of the uh, of the equipment uh, complexity, uh, you know, one of the things that we gave a great deal of thought to was safety. And, and we do that with everything that we build. And, and, and so uh, the system is very, very safe. And, and I think that any high school using it would, uh, do, you know, certainly can feel comfortable that they, that, that their students are, are, are going to be in a good environment. And, and then really comes down to time. How much time do they have to spend on it? Because each one of the programs is to about 200 hours and it might take longer uh, for a high school student. That's some, something that we're really testing. Uh, right now. So I think uh, it certainly is uh, is within reasonable expectations that a high school student could come out with the first certification, maybe the second one, uh, but also having worked on elements of all three of, of the certifications and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and certainly this is a, a program that they can continue on into a dual credit uh, program through to the college uh, or into the incumbent workforce like Target is doing. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, Charles, you touched uh, during your presentation a little bit, a little bit on some of your work with the partners and uh, potentially on some of the work that is underway to take this sort of model program to the next level. Can you shed a little bit uh, more light on that? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that story that that Josh, you know, told a little bit about that technician that said how much he had learned in the course of, of three months. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, it's easy to kind of just go past that, that statement that he felt like he had learned more in, in, his, in the, that three month period of this contextualized, you know, training than, you know, than he had learned in, in, in multiple years of, of, you know, just education alone. And, you know, just as Josh said, it wasn't a, it wasn't a um, indictment of the education but it was really promoting how effective this model is of, of, of learning being embedded in, you know, you know, into that, into work like that. And so a couple of things that we're really looking forward to doing. So one is setting up, uh, you know, uh, pre-apprenticeship pathways. I think this is relevant to that question about like the high school students setting, uh, setting kids up, setting job seekers up uh, so that they know, what skills they are in demand? What skills are important? What, what skills are going to help them, you know, get a job and be relevant to the, the uh, you know, companies that are in the area? So we're, we're excited to begin expanding that, uh, creating more opportunities for people that aren't already in, you know, in this industry to get, get involved in that training. And then our work with college faculty is to really look at, um, you know, I, I'll say this, it's, this is a challenging program for a college to take on. And so I, I admire, you know, the courage of the, the, the colleges that do, because what it requires you to do is to really look at education through a competency-based lens instead of only a, you know, kind of class and lab hours lens. And that's, uh, that's really challenging, but I think it's, I think it's the future. Um, I think it's something that, you know, if we really learn how to embrace this, we're going to provide a lot of opportunities for a lot of students to engage in programs like this. And I think if we, if we don't do that, you know, if we fail to do that, I think we're going to miss our window of, of opportunity to, you know, really make a program like this a normal thing. Uh, you know, not the exception, but actually the rule. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. Um, a comment from Margarita B and uh, Terrell Bailey's floating something at me. Um, Margarita, the best way to get your question answered is to email Paul Perkins at paul underscore perkins at amitrol.com. Um, so um, Josh, we had a question come in. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about the virtual classroom setup and uh, how, what, that, what sort of win that is for the Target Corporation. Can you shed a little bit more light on what you guys are hoping to accomplish with that? Or kind of what the goals are, or how broadly you're rolling out, or any more context on that virtual classroom piece? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first step is uh, really uh, testing this with our first pilot building at a Cedar Falls. Um, so far, again, we've only been three weeks into this, but uh, we've extended this 
opportunity out to the network. So um, this year, Target was uh, provided um, these positions, these MTT positions from a labor um, budgetary standpoint um, to be able to staff. Um, so with that comes the questions from each of the sites. How do I staff these positions and what do I do with them? So we're trying to provide that avenue to take advantage of the Southern California Training Center um, to, to plug in virtually. And what this does is it ensures that as the MTTs at other sites don't necessarily go um, independently into the program, but they go in it with a group of, of, of MTTs or peers that are experiencing it themselves, bringing up those questions throughout the modules, but most importantly, having the instructor available real time to ask those questions. So through the training, there's demonstrations that the instructor does. There's um, different types of uh, skills that he'll showcase on the um, skill boss logistics so they can visually start seeing. So we've seen some of that stuff unfold. Again, more, more time will tell how that works out, but we're really hoping that this reaches out outside the four walls because uh, this is something that MTTs are now available at all our distribution centers. So, Awesome. Yes. awesome. Steve, if I could follow up sure, for a moment. Sure, Phil, please. You know, it, it's not economically... Uh, feasible for us to create a full-fledged training center at every one of our DCs. You know, we did this as our first one in Southern California because the number of distribution centers, we're looking at a framework where some of them will be full-fledged training centers across the country. But in most cases, we're going to be looking at what sort of creative partnerships can we look to do? So, this is where I'm very interested in talking with uh, community colleges in the area and so forth to see, does it make sense for us to purchase a unit? Does it make sense for a community college to purchase a unit? How can we take advantage of resources like the uh, remote learning piece where we take advantage of Zoom, which we've learned how to do as a subset of COVID uh, in order to go ahead and be able to give somebody sort of that uh, classroom type environment to supplement the self-learning or self-paced learning that they're able to go ahead and do with the certified technician supply chain automation framework. I just cannot say enough about what Amitrol has done overall from a training perspective. You know, this is absolutely the bee's knees in terms of uh, the, the best uh, stuff that we have ever seen in terms of technical training content packaged in a very usable fashion and complemented by an incredible lab device that makes it so easy for us to both train as well as to go ahead and certify. Excellent, excellent, Phil. Thank you so much. And that's actually a, a, great, uh, um, a great way to wrap up today's session. 